Uh, good morning, my name is Gabriela Vasquez. I'm here with Jennifer Aguilera and Daniel Hidalgo. We are Team Ford. Today we'll be presenting the inspection vehicle for the Department of Energy Hanford Site Underground Tank Channels. Uh, first and foremost, our objective is to develop an inspection vehicle um, that will travel within a small size uh, a small size channel. This channel is about four centimeters by four centimeters and it will have to travel a total distance of about five meters. The reason for this inspection vehicle is because at the Department of Energy in Hanford site, the retrieval of radioactive material produced vast quantities of high level waste. This high level waste is stored in double shell tanks. As seen in the top photo, these double shell tanks consist of a primary tank that rests on a refractory pad that's all within a secondary tank liner. These refractory pads, as seen here, have these slots that act as cooling channels. Uh, back in 2012, waste material was found in the annulus between the primary and secondary tank. And so um, they believe that the waste is leaking from the primary tank, traveling through the cooling channels and into the annulus. So our design parameters. Um, we'll only be traveling about five meters of the tank because that, uh, with the 72 entry points of the tank, that will already cover 70% of the area of the tank. Um, we want to minimize damage to the refractory pad. The refractory pad, as you can see in this photo, is uh, friable, so it breaks apart easily. And we want to minimize damage as it, um, as, so, to avoid creating a debris. We also want to provide visual feedback so that they can actually see the primary tank conditions and then find out where these leakages are coming from. And then in the event of malfunction, provide a means of retrieval um, to pull back the uh, device. Our motivation um, is the environmental impact. Um, the Columbia River is located about five miles away from where the underground tanks are located, and so we want to ensure that this waste does not breach that secondary tank liner as that waste would uh, creep into the subsurface soil and then obviously affect the ecosystem and the communities that rely on that river. Additionally, it's globally applicable. applicable. Uh, radioactive waste management is something that most developed countries with a nuclear program do have to deal with is they do create um, high level waste that has to be stored in tanks that require frequent inspection um, to monitor leakage. So industry alternatives, the Department of Energy reached out um, to different uh, companies and um, they proposed different devices to solve this problem. Um, for different reasons, they did not continue their efforts for these devices. For example, Arriva's sea snake, sea snake micro wheel um, requires mechanical assistance from the surface, um, while Curion's crawl mounted roller tube would uh, destroy the refractory pad as it traveled along um, the bottom. So uh, they didn't continue those, those efforts, and so we uh, stepped in and took on the challenge. Um, and so what we came up with was essentially, as you can see in this top photo, our idea was to obviously incorporate a camera so that you can actually see what you were looking at within the channel. We wanted to avoid the refractory pad completely, so what we did was we uh, incorporated a magnet that will attach to the carbon steel tank as it travels along the top of the, uh, uh, as it travels through the, the channel. And then um, it'll fit within the small channel size. Originally, we had, we wanted to use a magnetic tank tread um, to increase the surface area as it, as it traveled through. Um, and then we also had uh, motors and then we used gears to try to increase that torque. And then we had, then when that didn't work through the uh, prototype development, we incorporated a lot of, we found a lot of challenges. Uh, we then moved into uh, smaller and thinner wheels, um, but that also proved uh, difficult because there wasn't enough surface area. So we came up with our final design, and you can see him here. He's actually quite small. Um, so this is this is him, and um, <laughs> essentially it's we simplified it, um, and it contains four motors. As you can at the top, each attached to um, the wheels. It has the magnetic plate on top, and that magnetic plate, you can kind of see it here, is a distance from the top of the tank. Um, and we did that so that it, the motors don't have to overcome the frictional force of that magnet sliding along the top of the tank, um, but it still feels that magnetic force so that it can travel through. And then obviously the camera at the bottom um, so that you can see the, um, the primary tank condition. Thank you, Gary. Good morning, everyone. Um, the mechanical components consist of four uh, planetary six millimeter DC uh, gear motors, four wheels, two magnetic plates, and a USB inspection camera. As you can see, we compared it to uh, the size of a penny. As a reference, you can see the, how small the items were that we were dealing with. 
our electric components, our power source was a 12 volt sealed lead acid battery. Uh, the reason why we use this is because it has a high power to weight ratio. Um, and they're very economical and they can output the amount of current that we needed uh, for, to move the inspection device through the channel. The brains, the brains of the operation was the, the Arduino Uno, which oh, the only drawback that it had was that it can only output 40 milliamps per channel. Uh, per motor. So we had to incorporate an L298H bridge so we can push the 80 milliamps to 150 milliamps that we needed to be able to go through the channel. Our experimental setup, uh, we tried to simulate the environment of, of the refractory patch. So we use a KLI 2200 within the channel. As you can see it's 4.9 meters by 3.8 centimeters. So we can, by 3.8 centimeters. So we can uh, get accurate results and it's within the same environment that it would be in this other factory channel. Our major design constraints was uh, the vehicle's ability to pull the weight of the tether as it travels through the channel, as well as the magnetic force required by the magnet to hold the vehicle atop. So, to find the torque required, we first needed to find the force of the tether. Uh, so this is the relationship that we have here. We have the input vehicle's parameters and the tether force. So the torque is the torque uh, required to be supplied by the motor and uh, R is the radius of the wheel and left is force created by the tether friction. So we first need to calculate the tether friction. Uh, so we put the complete tether in, on the entire channel and then we slowly lifted it up until the force of gravity overcame the friction of force and then it gave us an angle and with that angle we're able to calculate the uh, friction of force. So we did 10 trials and we got an average angle of 30.66 and a standard deviation of only two, which gave us pretty accurate and precise results. So then we calculated the amount of force of the tether, which is 1.15 newtons. And with that, we're able to do a torque analysis. Uh, so we calculated the torque based on the radius and force of the force required to be able to move through the channel. And the torque required is eight million newton meters just to be able to move, just to get the, the inspection device moving through the channel. So the uh, motor came with a spec sheet uh, from the manufacturer, which is on the screen here. And we needed to find, well, we know that torque is, a, is a proportional to the amount of current flowing through the motor. So we needed to find the, the current that we needed to be able to generate the torque to be able to move this inspection device, right? So initially we needed 80, um, 80 milliamps, as we stated, to be able to move, I'm sorry, yeah, to be able to generate two million newton meters, we need, based on this graph, 80 milliamps. And we were working at 150 milliamps, our maximum output to be able to generate a velocity, but just to be able to get it moving, we needed 80 milliamps. But we were uh, slightly skeptic about this um, graph, so we did some tests to verify that the specifications of the motor were actually correct. So the test that we did was we put a load on the outer diameter of the wheel, and since we know the radius and we know the load, then we can um, put a current through the motor, and if it starts turning the wheel, then we know that that was the torque uh, required, I'm sorry, the current required to generate that torque. Hmm. And we did that multiple times, and we got a torque accuracy of about 10% uh, in comparison to that uh, spec sheet. All right, so in order to figure out the magnet strength that we needed for our device to travel through the shadow. We needed to know what was the weight of our vehicle and also what was the force of the tether pulling it down. Um, that, by adding these two components, we obtained a 1.3 newtons of minimum force of the magnet um, that we needed. Um, based on this, we, and the size of our vehicle, we determined that we wanted to test three different magnets and see what was the effect on the velocity and how the vehicle behaved. So we chose uh, three magnets that could uh, hold more than the, the force that we needed, and these three magnets would give us a force of 2, 8, and 12 meters. Um, this, this graph shows how uh, the three magnets that we obtain, how the distance uh, from the plate affects the, the force. And as you can see, as you move further away, uh, the force increases exponentially. In order to determine uh, the velocity of our device, we need to do some velocity testing. Um, this, this picture shows the, the setup that we utilize. We put um, 
a plate on the floor and we put marks every 10 centimeters so until we obtain 100 centimeters. And uh, our device was put, um, well, it was put normal. It wasn't put upside down, but we figured that our the, the weight of our, of our device was very minimal and it was negligible in this um, condition. So with the testings, and we hold the tether so that the, the velocity testing would only pertain to the device itself and, the, and how the motors and the magnet would um, affect the motors, basically. So the velocity, we did, initially we did the velocity testing just to see how each magnet behaves and we obtained uh, these curves and as you can see the, the yellow line would be the low strength magnet. This low strength magnet would give us a high velocity of 37 centimeters per second while the medium strength magnet will give us a velocity of 22.9 centimeters per second and the high strength magnet 18.8. We observed that the small strength, the low strength magnet, would would not give enough force for the device to hold up through the entire channel. And um, on the other hand, we saw that the high strength magnet would overload the motors and it would fatigue them and it would break them easily. So we chose to do the rest of our tr velocity trials with the middle magnet, and that's the magnet that we used in our final design. In order to know what was the sample size that we needed, so how many velocity testings we needed to conduct, we used the normal C distribution method. And this formula requires you to pick a confidence level and margin of error and input the standard deviation. Um, we, we assumed a confidence level of 1.96 for um, accurate results and a margin of error of plus or minus minus one. Um, the standard deviation, we needed to define it. And we did several trials. Uh, in five trials actually, and we obtained velocities, average, and standard deviation. With that standard deviation, we went back to that formula, and with the assumed values, we defined the sample size. This sample size would give us how many trials, additional trials of the velocity we needed to, um, to do. And it was 14.8, we rounded up to 15 additional velocity trials. And these trials were done with the medium strength magnet. Um, as you can see, this table shows that the entire 15 trials, the average, and the fitted curve. The fitted curve will give us 22.9 centimeters per second, and the standard deviation of 1.4 will give accuracy to our results. This video shows the device traveling through the entire channel. Uh, it traveled five meters per five meters, and while pulling the tether. Uh, we use potential meters to regulate the voltage on each side, and this will um, give us the direction of our device. Um, the average velocity observed in this situation was 12.3 centimeters per second, and that went down from 22 centimeters per second without the tether, meaning that the tether pulling it back, it uh, lowered the speed 10, 10 centimeters per second. This picture on the bottom shows uh, a view of the device inside the channel, and this is how this device can be used to inspect these channels. So I just want to um, summarize again um, all of our testings and the analysis we, we did and how our device um, met all the goals that we, well, we had put uh, for this year to complete. And um, so based on the force analysis that we did of the feather pulling it back, we determined how much torque our motors needed. Based on the weight of the object and the tether pulling it down, we determined how, mu how much strength of the magnet we needed. And through our analysis, we determined that our device was able, with the motors chosen for the small um, size that we needed, we were able to make this device go from the entire five meters, providing visual feedback with the camera, and provide some means of, of retrieval with the tether. Um, this video shows the device at the last half how, how it, it made it through. <laughs> okay, so that's really the summary of the technical aspect of the project, but there were other aspects um, that you are on the evaluation sheet that we want to cover. So starting with the engineering standards, um, for the engineering standards for the mechanical components, we really focused on the drawings that we created in case this device would be replicated. Um, that those drawings incorporate all the tolerances and units so that it can uh, the manufacturing can be streamlined. The components for the mechanical, uh, we ensure that when we purchase those components, they use uh, quality management systems. 
and then for the electrical components that they didn't meet the IEEE standards. For teamwork, um, as you can see, we, uh, based on the strengths of the, each of the different members, we kind of broke down um, each of the uh, completed um, tasks. But as you can see, each task, at least two people were working on it. We really made this a team effort. Um, so no one was alone. There was always you know, discussion and support in creating this, um, this device. Uh, for the timeline, we, obviously this is throughout the entire year. And so we wanted to ensure to meet those deadlines as specified. Um, and so we set up those goals so that we could complete um, the project on time. Um, we understand that this prototype, obviously the frame you saw is 3D printed. Um, you know, there were a lot of components that, um, that we purchased due to our capabilities um, financially. So we know that this uh, device would have, to be, um, would have to be redone with you know, stainless steel, with a radiation tolerant uh, material, so that it could withstand the harsh conditions of the tank. And so we also uh, wanted to point out that because it's simplified, that the components are simplified, um, compared to their counterparts as proposed by the, um, by the companies, our device would um, have a much lower cost. Um, you know, we did some limited research. We know that the camera that was available was about $4,000, um, and it, it's the size that we need in radiation tolerant and, and corrosion resistance. So um, compared to its counterparts of about that, you know, the proposed technologies were over 100000 we understand that you know this device still you know falls low enough that when it, if it were to malfunction or if it were to be contaminated, um, the device would have to be disposed of and they would just have to use another one. Um, the economic aspect for the cost breakdown: um, in total, we assumed uh, you know twelve dollars per hour. You know, we're engineers. You know, we're still students, so and that actually uh, took up the majority of the the the, the salary. I guess the, the total cost of the project. Um, the component itself was about two hundred and thirty-seven dollars, split up evenly between the electrical components that were one hundred and thirty-four, while the mechanical components were one hundred and three. And you can see the four different um, mechanical components that that were purchased. Uh, lifelong learning, um, something that we really, you know, it wasn't readily available, you know, on the internet. Something that we really found through this project was the effect of the magnetic force uh, on the velocity. And so, when replicating this device, you know, they would be able to reference something like this to understand that obviously, when you make that radiation tolerant, it gets bigger, it's heavier, you know, whatever the case may be. They know that okay, you, you're going to need a stronger magnet in order to withhold it as it travels through the channel. Uh, global learning for global awareness. Um, our sponsor, the Department of Energy, um, are aware that you know this community engagement as this is something that's applicable worldwide, and so they do have a program um, that uses that works with other countries in this technology exchange. As we all are facing similar issues, you know we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So this this project is part of that program um, for technology and information exchange. A global perspective, we are aware that worldwide 9.8 million liters of waste are produced every year and that waste has to be stored um, in repositories. So again, this device is something that you know, would have to be used to, uh, to provide a frequent inspection. And finally, global engagement. Um, those companies that propose the technologies are international companies and we use the devices that they propose to the Department of Energy and we use their lessons learned in the development of ours. We knew that we couldn't use wheels to travel along the refractory pad because it would create uh, debris. And then nationally, we collaborated with the Hanford Site Engineers through, for the information acquisition and, um, and throughout the development of the device. Um, so recommendations, obviously safety is our top priority. So when creating this uh, device, you know, the next generation, um, they would have to use the DOE's technical standard um, to incorporate safety and ensuring that the device would um, be able to be used. And then uh, to operate within the harsh conditions, they would have to use an authentic stainless steel that provides um, the corrosion resistance, the temperature, and the radiation tolerance that's, that's required. So in conclusion, uh, we did work cohesively together to complete this project. We learned a lot um, about the project and about each other, so it was, it was a, good, a, a good year. Um, we understand that it's our ethical responsibility to properly treat and store this legacy waste, and we hope that Bug's uh, inspection vehicle um, is the first step in that process. So we did meet our design challenges of fitting within the small channel, traveling the complete five meters, um, avoiding the damage of the refractory pad by traveling upside down, and incorporating that camera for the um, for to view the, the channel. 
So we'd like to thank the Department of Energy, um, the Applied Research Center here at FIU, and our advisor, Dr. Basil, and uh, Dr. McDaniel, Mr. Harmonic, and Mr. Washingtonfelder. Thank you. It looks like as little cost as you had in it, you could make tons of those if you got all of them. And it'd be much cheaper just to run it down once, throw it away. You run it down once, throw it away, than it would be to spend $10,000. And now I look at all these little, well, at least on the TV, um, you know, tr you know the, the, uh, the guys that go out in the, in the uh, uh, what do you call it? I, I'm thinking of the detectives and stuff like that. They always seem to have a little bug in their, yeah. you know, um, prove all kinds of TV shows like that. Seems like you get a little tiny camera that would fit in there, one of these very cheap ones with a light like on my, on my camera. And it seems to me that what you've invented here is a substantially inexpensive device that works. works. Thank you. I have a quick question. Um, now, the, the sample you saw was a nice smooth plate on top, but out in the real world, you're going to have bumps and stuff build up on metal. And let's say you're, no, normally does it go that fast, or is it, was the video sped up? No, no, we had the potential meter, we were going that fast. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking, if you're going that fast and you hit a nice bump, it might just move no, the magnet away so it disconnects from metal, then it drops. So have you thought about that? Yeah, well, with the Arduino, you can control the speed. Okay. So we can go through the channel much slower, and we can control, basically, we want to stop at certain point we could to inspect it. That's right. A little bit, bit For bit bumps, bit. also we have, a, and yeah, we could, we could maneuver left and right, because okay. each side is controlled independently by the Arduino, as well as the, uh, the magnet had a buffer zone, basically. Uh, like you saw, it can lift uh, 8 newtons, but it only weighed about 2.2. Mm -hmm. Because it is an exponential curve, if it does hit a bump or something, we need it to be able to maintain that. Um, Okay, uh, can your wheels run clockwise and counterclockwise? Yes. Okay, uh, so when you run this in re you run this in reverse to pull it out of the system? No, uh, essentially the way that because of the tether you can pull it up, pull it backwards. But if you wanted to, you could run it in reverse. Okay, did the wheels clutch or something so that they had the ability to be released? I mean, uh, what's going to happen when you try to tether, pull it back, and those wheels lock up? Lock up? If the wheels lock up, well, if you pull on it because of, of the angle of the tether, it'll just drop onto the refractory. And I don't to do worry it. about breaking up the refractory. Yes. That's a concern I would have with that. So what I was thinking is you need to either have the wheels be able to release so that you can roll it back on the tether. So like a clutch system. That or have the ability release. to run it back so that you don't drop it on your yeah. refractory. Well, if the wheels don't lock up, then it could go backwards. But in the case of the wheels, do lock up. Oh, is it designed to? Yeah, so that that's why you have the, the L298 bridge. You can change the direction of, uh, because of the transistors and everything, you can change the direction of, the, of which, the widgets. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, uh, by the way, I love the report and I love the presentation. You did a great job. Um, the question I have is tied to radiation and temperature. Do you think about temperature's impact on the magnet? magnet? Um, for the magnet, the magnet where, where we purchased the components from, it does specify that that magnet would be able to withstand the, the temperature. So that, that magnet does operate within that. that does magnet. the magnetic field change as a function of temperature? I'm not sure. But I mean. And, and it does. So, that, so really the question that I'm asking you is do you have a sufficient magnetic output from that magnet at those temperature ranges? Well, what's great about that um, about that company that supplies the magnets? They are, I mean, they have them like almost the size of a fingernail um, that can provide that amount of of force. So, in that case, if it if it does affect the magnetic field, there would be other um, magnets that could be used um, to to supply that if need be. Okay. Then last, um, what is the useful life of your robot? Uh, do you have any plan on how you would dispose? Of Dispose of it after you complete the usual. <laughs> well, um, we did some testing in these motors, but over these motors are ten dollars. So these are not the motors that. But how we, how long do you think this thing would survive? We did. I mean, are you going to be able to do all of the? No. We with don't a single so. robot? No, we don't. We don't think so. Um, so it, there has to be some type of disposal of the device, um, but. 
that was left to the engineers I had to recite because they, they have put this device there, so they know how to dispose of them. So the, it wasn't the scope of this project to worry about that disposal mechanism. We were just more cons concerned on that it traveled through the channel and that it could be sitting there. Just throw it in the tank when you're done. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like they have a collection of these sitting in the corner yeah. somewhere. There's a repository just for all of those. <laughs> okay, thank you. I just want to congratulate you for the way you presented your work and uh, you obviously studied the evaluation criteria that we're using, which is uh, very unusual, and I applaud you for that because it makes our work very easy back there. So but good thanks job. to our advisor, we do have to say thank I, you. I figure, 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 I yeah. He's been through a lot. We had to take him apart, put him back together. So the magnet's not there, but you can kind of look at him and I guess could just kind of hold it and pass it around if you'd like to see. But he's small, so. <laughs> no, very good. Yeah, I'm going to put on my project manager hat for a second here. Uh, I've looked at your schedule here. Um, you got to get to take the summer off. <laughs> uh, we were away, so okay. <laughs> Germany, you know, different internships and stuff, so. Absolutely understand. And then the next question would be, um, having gone through this now, having walked through the process, scheduling, um, organizing it that way, um, do you think you could improve upon it, and, and how, how well do you think you could improve upon it? Well, as you saw, there was a progression initially. We had um, gears, the manufacturing process of it. Uh, we brought it down from a few hours to maybe manufacturing of about 45 minutes to an hour. All three of us working together, 3D printing it and putting it together about two hours. Whereas before, and it took us a full day, a day and a half to get it working because we would glue it in ways that we couldn't take it back apart. We made it so if one of the motors failed, we could take it apart, replace the motor, put it back on, and continue doing our tests. So Going back, I think if we would have started the manufacturing earlier, there was a lot of analysis done and you know a lot of solid work so we felt like you know we were pretty confident but it wasn't until we actually put it together that we yeah. realized like okay this will work this won't so that was fun. I was there not that long ago so we always said start manufacturing at the beginning of summer at the latest <laughs> for this session. Any other comments? Thank you. Thank you.